Thank you for your patience and we hope you enjoy the event. Well, thanks so much, Lisa, for that um, intro and housekeeping. I am uh, really excited to be introducing our poets tonight. Um, a little bit to a hint of the format, we're going to have Quentin and Daniel pretty much lead the show. They're gonna do some readings and then have some conversation and there's more readings. So um, once I introduce their, uh, then they're gonna take it on themselves. So um, without any further ado, uh, Daniel B. Summerhill is an assistant professor of poetry and social action and composition studies at California State University, Monterey Bay. He has performed in over 30 states and has been, um, sorry, the UK and was invited by the US Embassy to guest lecture and perform in South Africa. His work has appeared in or is forthcoming in Obsidian, Rust and Moth, Button Poetry, The Hellebore, and others. His collection, Divine, 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 is available now from Oakland based Nomadic Press. Quentin Collins, he, him, is a writer, editor, and Solstice MFA program assistant director. His work appears in many print and online publications. And his first full length collection of poems is The Dandelion Speaks of Survival. His second collection of poems, Claim Tickets for Stolen People, selected by Marcus Jackson as winner of the journal's 2020 Charles B. Wheeler Prize, is forthcoming from the Ohio State University Press Mad Creek Books in 2022. Wow. Uh, Quinton won the 2019 Atlantis Award from the Poets Billow, and his other accolades include Pushcart Prize and Best of Net nominations. Um, and as well as being a finalist for various awards. And you can see more of his work at qqualinswriter.com. So please help me welcome Daniel from Monterey Bay, California and Quentin from Brookline, Massachusetts. Wow, thanks. Um, thanks so much, Becca. So fresh to, to be here with, with many uh, Solstice peers. So, so shout out to y'all, thanks for being here. And you know, like what a lovely event to have with, with, with my brother Quentin um, amidst our, our release of our, our uh, inaugural collection. So so thanks to, to both Lisa and Becca for, for throwing this and for everything, um, you know, getting, getting us on board in, in uh, this event. Yeah, thank you both um, for organizing. Thank you, Patrick, for organizing everything in the background. And thank you all for being here. I realized like, you know, it's a Wednesday night and you're here for poetry instead of like, you know, watching Loki on Disney Plus. So I really appreciate it because I know that show is like, it's really good so far. So like the fact that you're here means a lot. Um, so yeah, you know, Dan, you want to just get right into it with some poems? Yeah, go for it. All right, so how about this? I'm, I'm going to throw you a little bit of an audible. I want to hit you with one, you hit me with one. Does that sound good? You curveballing, okay. Yeah, we, we curveballing already, that's what we do. Wait. All right, so um, I'm going to kick it off with Ice Cream e Economics, um, which is a bit of a nostalgic throwback to chasing the ice cream truck in my neighborhood. <clears throat> you chase melody. Xylophone reverberations crawl up rather slow terrace. Sneakers percuss sidewalks. Pause, double dutch. Hi-hats, temp basketball timpanies. Screen doors slap shut like cymbals. Faster tempos as kids bolts, pockets, maraca, nickels, quarters, dimes, adolescence drum roll right up to the window. Heaves, sweat, coral, cacophony, demand, bomb pops, good humor, strawberry shortcake and toasted almond, Tweety Birds, gumball, eyes bulged. Coins chime the counter, crescendo, these crinkled wrappers, the ice cream man passes a choco taco. Two dollar bills from your parents' full-time paychecks. Dollar seventy-five decadence. Dollars shush like sandpaper blocks. See their grit. These other kids now silent, envy sticky. Pop the quarter in your pocket. So now I want you to hit me with um, Albany Middle School teaches a lesson in entrepreneurship. Okay. Albany Middle School teaches a lesson on entrepreneurship. Our book bags be a black market. Meager juveniles brandishing singles behind black top filled fingernails in back pockets void of wallets. 
by nine, I break even. Jamel Prize opened his second box of Starbursts while Kumi brokers six bucks to a sixth grader for the lack of supply and huge demand. Half past noon, our surge comes to a halt when we gather behind the B building to compare profits and crack jokes on Jamel's short shorts. Tuesday through Thursday be the same saga, transactions in the hallways, while Friday be a Sabbath, a place for us to take flight over the basketball courts with our Nikes. On Sunday, Costco be a kingpin that knew we'd never miss a re-up unless Miss Peggy called our mothers for a meeting to discuss the school drop and lunch sales. Monday be a chalk talk, our first lesson on the ways our brown bodies aren't allowed to yield the same way other bodies are, aren't allowed to multiply the same. Wow. That's what I said after yours, man. Uh, yo, um, first of all, the prosody, like the sound uh, in ice cream economics is wow, yo. Um, and, and, and so I understand why you chose like Albany Middle School teaches a lesson on on entrepreneurship, because I think some of the cadence um, resembles one another. And I also think that there's this interesting um, nod to the ways that sound can actually evoke um, nostalgia, right? Like the, the ways that we use sound to evoke nostalgia. And I think that's a really interesting concept that, that I think you do, you accomplish, not in just this piece, but in like many of your poems very well, that idea that, um, the resonance of sound, right? A familiar sound and, and the descriptive sound you use um, is, is wild and descriptive and so vivid that it allows me to enter this poem in a way that, that I might not otherwise be able to. You know, I think that sound is an interesting thing because one of the like key aspects of your poems that's kind of woven in throughout is I love this idea. There's always some, some ancestry there, right? It's mm -hmm. so like one, you open this poem with our book bags B. Mm -hmm. Right. Very B, the very B. <laughs> right, right, right. And you know, like then we have a whole poem about like, you know, the the culture of hustling, right? Like that's like a huge thing, you know, for the community, but also, you know, how that moves through the poem in terms of, you know, again, the idea of ancestry. And I think like you you can't open a poem any other way but to say something like, you know, our book bags be a black market. And so not only are you getting that, you know, that B in there, man, but you reinforce it with, um, you know, that alliteration with the, our book bags, be a black market. So yeah. tell me a bit about like how you feel, you know, you see like the ways ancestry is not just moving through this poem, but moving through all your work in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, um, so I'm answer your question, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of circumvent <laughs> a bit. <laughs> I think, I think one of the things that's important, and, and you do this too, and I think that it's, um, and we've talked about this, uh, you know, separate from tonight, but we, we talked about the idea that um, it's important for us to kind of chronicle our own um, lives and childhood because um, history is only history if we have a story for it, right? And if it's, if it's written about, otherwise, like it didn't exist. Like history is only history because like there's a story, right? And so if we don't tell these stories, if we don't kind of chronicle, um, you know, our childhood and the things that, that we remember the most and that made us who we are, then, then you know, then, 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 you know, who are we, right? And where are we going? Um, so I think that when it comes to ancestry, I think it's also important to think about the ways in which we can kind of um, um, be adjacent to ancestry in a way that allows us to, to take part in both the past, but then also to bring that stuff forward um, in a way that helps us kind of understand life, understand ourselves, who we are right now, but then also helps us unpack where we're going. Um, and I think again, something like our, big, our book bags, Be a Black Market, it's a not to not only like ancestry and like the, you know, the kind of hustle kind of culture, but also to, to what it means to exist in the culture even now. Um, yeah. so. I hope that's a, that's a good buck of an answer to your question, but I hope that kind of kind of addresses it in, in, in some way. Um, but I do want to return to, go ahead, you want to say something? No, I was just going to say, you know, it's, it's crazy you talk about that, right? Like this idea of being adjacent to our ancestry. And it just makes me really consider like, you know, the roots of poetry, right? You know, poetry is kind of sit, still sitting in the academy to, to a great extent, but 
know, we think about those communal roots, you know, yeah. where it was out in you know, the public square and all that. And that's like, so I, I love the art form for what we're kind of working in, right? Because like, it's us bringing that communal um, ancestry of the of the art form, right? It's, it's, a, it's a meta discussion around it too, right? The art form itself is communal. And we're using that to yep. do some of that work to move through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I want to return to something that you said um, and that again, we talked about, and that's somebody told you um, uh, to make sure to chronicle like, specifically our our time period in our childhood, right, like right. 90s, um, early 2000s, like what does it mean to, to do that? Why is that important? Um, and then what approach do you take when doing that? Like, is it just like, I'm worried about everything from my childhood? In which way, you know, do you decide to write about it? How does that, how does that work out? And who was it that said that also? <laughs> oh man, this was actually, um, uh... Uh, uh, I'm not going to call him a, y- a young poet in the sense of young, but a, a young poet as in he started in Solstice with us, um, Chris Butler, actually. We were having a whole conversation about, you know, hey, like, we writing a lot of poems that are about some stuff that was from this time. How much have we seen it, right? Because we're in this period where millennials like ourselves are hitting this age where we're not only publishing a lot, but, you know, we we, we finished our MFAs if we're getting them and all of our education. And so we're all publishing this work in the same sphere. And there's just mm-hmm. so many topics that are coming to mind, right? Like I was just talking the other day. I was like, you remember like back in the early 2000s, like I, mean, I got a poem about waves in here, but like braids, like cornrows mm-hmm. were huge for a bit. Well, think, you know, like yeah. every rapper had cornrows. And I'm just like, I don't know if I've seen the cornrows poem yet, but I was like, that's yeah. like a huge piece of like, you know, the um, the vibe. And I think about, you know, even then, you know, like that and that idea of ancestry too. Like, how do you write that poem in a way that calls back to the fact that, you know, my father had cornrows when he was a kid, you know, at some yeah. point, right? There's like this, this nature of um, these time bound threads that you can't help but bring in when you're starting to root through your own nostalgia and linking back and forth. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's do it. I'm gonna jump back <laughs> in because, because uh, we're talking about ancestry. We're talking about the way that lineage affects um, our work, right, and how we, we work through it and, and mitigate it through our work. So I'm gonna hit you with the title piece of Divine, Divine, Divine. Uh, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to share it, share a joint too. So this is the title poem, Divine, Divine, Divine. Ain't no mama allowing their baby to swing from a tree without divine permission. Asked, the corner to tuck the revolution in his size six sneakers. Ask the mortician to embalm his face. Nobody will care if the swelling goes down. Nobody will care if the swelling goes down. But mama says nobody will care. If the swelling goes down, ain't no mama. Morning tomorrow, tonight, we'll have to do. Tomorrow will be sort of a minstrel show. And then ain't nobody gonna be laughing then besides they'll see how beautiful he's become and be ashamed. And I'm gonna ask you to read one of my favorite joints, The Water I Come From. Oh, dope, dope. Um, let me find that. Man, I already got a question for you on that poem, but I'm gonna I'm, I'm, I'm hold it. Hold I'm, on, I'm gonna hear, hear yours first. <laughs> I'm not gonna be too greedy off the bat. Maybe I will, we'll find out. <laughs> uh, this is The Water I Come From. Say my daddy never taught me to swim. Say I saw the Atlantic search for humpbacks, like bodies flung off a bow. Say they break water, say wet. Say a flood in my basement asserts how high water will rise to kill me. Say Brandon never came home. Say their names on the ocean floor, say salt water, ate my ancestors' bones, say slave skulls slapped east coast shores and king tides, say I steep in these waters, say I never stop drowning. Okay, um, I'm gonna ask my question first. <laughs> okay, okay. Because, because the refrain in that, in, that, in that poem, I think is what makes it, like for me, it's what kind of, um, so there's there's illusions right within the poem, and I think those illusions come through with that that refrain to say to say to say. And I think so. Um, 
may be striking or appealing to me about it is this idea of um, the say um, kind of happening like a, um, what's the word? Like a, um, 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 gosh, it's when, you, when, you, when you're saying something, um, but the thing that you're saying is something that is not normally said, right? So it's like you're saying say, but the things that you're alluding to aren't things that are typically said or referenced or brought to the forefront because of course they're, they're suppressed. So I guess my question in all of that is, um, um, when it comes to illusion within that poem, within the landscape of that poem, like how did you approach it? Was it like, you know, I have this concept, I have these ideas about things I wanna to allude to, or was it like, you know, or, or how did it come about? Like, right, how did the illusion kind of, kind of manifest itself in that poem? And how does that relate to the say that, that's referenced re repeatedly? I gotta say the say was probably influenced by some of your work. Cause I, th I, I think, <laughs> I think, I read one of your poems and you had, you know, a similar use of repetition. I was like, I got to do that. So, yeah. I, I mean, I would say that about a lot of my poems. So just, just so you are aware, you're going to be name dropped a lot in this conversation that you're already in. But, you know, I think with the illusions, you know, it was this, this crazy thing um, where after I graduated, you know, from Solstice and got my MFA and all that, one of the things I wanted to do was go um, well watching that weekend um you know and that was my first time ever being out on the ocean and I was just sitting there thinking I was like man it's crazy like I've never seen the ocean until you know at least the Atlantic I hadn't seen it until recently and this is my first time being in the water right and I was like it's crazy that like I have such a ancestral history with this body of water and this is my first time interacting with it yeah. And then you start to, you know, when you live in like the Boston area long enough, you start to go on enough of these tours where like they start to sheepishly say like, oh, yeah. And like they sold slaves right down here by the harbor. And here's cheers. You know, like it's it, there's this crazy juxtaposition of tourism and, you know, the freedom trail and all that. And like this idea of the founding of America. And then like, you know, of course, we have things like CRT, now critical race theory, the 1619 project that kind of like complicate that. So like, as that conversation's building up, I'm living in the city and the ocean's right here. And I'm just like, man, like this ocean has taken so much, right? So what is the meaning of water, you know, in my life and in my ancestry? Because it's not just, you know, like this body of water. There's a lot of stories that are sitting there yeah. for myself that trail down. And I even just was like, man, like, yeah, I can't swim, right? Like, <laughs> and the ability to swim meant a lot for a lot of people, you know, those people going back who were being transported across, like, for some of them, the ability to swim meant nothing. It, you know, it, it was escape, whether or not you, you could swim or not when you got down there. So I was like, there's a lot to, to mull on that, you know, a lot of history to think about and a lot of how that revision happens. Um, and I think that's one of the key things I enjoyed about your poem, specifically because of, you know, the repetition where you say, um, nobody will care if the swelling goes down, nobody will care if the swelling goes down, but mama says nobody will care if the swelling goes down, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, every time I read that, I find a new meaning on the repetition, right? Because the first time I was like, you know, oh, okay, cool. You know, like there's there's an effect there because I, I, I recognize the historical event you're referencing, mm -hmm. but then I got to like really understand like, you know, that turn, right? That turn of how when you repeat it, it changes its meaning each time. And so can you tell me a bit about um, this idea of like how you're using your poetry um, as you're doing here to kind of like build in this idea of how history is kind of like written and revised and how like you're speaking a truth through whatever thread you're pulling that? Yeah, that's a big question. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so I think with this poem in particular, and this is a poem that like, I shopped around, it's never been published outside of this book. And I shopped it around and, you know, nobody wanted it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's all good because it's actually one of my favorite pieces, one of my favorite poems. And I think, first of all, it's important to like be like, hey, this is my poem. I don't care if like never gets published anywhere. Like this is this is my joint. And that's what this piece is for me. And I think mostly because of like the sentiment and the, the sentiment, exactly what you're talking about, the idea that, um, using um, this suffering, uh, you know, Mammy Till deciding, no, I want the world to see um, what they did to my, to my boy. I want the world to see what they turned him into, how they, you know, how he's not, not, not recognizable again. And so I think, you know, 
um, saying that line once the repetition, like I repeated it because saying that line one time, um, you know, nobody will care if the swelling goes down. It's, it's not enough, right? It's this idea that, that, you know, repeating it, but then changing the line breaks. Um, and then of course, adding those slashes um, changes meaning each time. So it's more, more than just nobody will care if the swelling goes down. It's also, you guys need to see this. It's also um, nobody will care anyway, but I'm gonna say it again and again and again until, um, you know, your ears bleed or until, you know, something changes, until something shifts. So it's this idea that I'm gonna beat you over the head with, with, with this concept. Um, not so much as an appeal for, for, for pity or empathy, but because you all need to see this and hear this, right? Regardless if you receive it or not. Um, so I think that's really like the, the idea behind the repetition, aside from like the craft stuff, right? It's, you know, it's bigger than that, it's larger than that. It's more so about the sentiment, the, 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 the kind of idea that, no, I'm, you're gonna hear this regardless if you want to or not. You're gonna hear it over and over and over again. Um, not so much so that you care, but so that you hear it, right? Um, and I think that's it. Like it, it, can be, it can be that simple, right? I'm gonna expose you to this thing. I'm gonna expose you to this atrocity, right? Regardless of, of how you feel about it. Um, and I think that's how Mammy Till felt, right? Like when you, right. you, you know, your, 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 your kid's been mutilated the way that he was, right? Um, you all need to see this, right? Um, I want the world to see what they did to my, to my baby. Um, and that the poem does no, no service to, to, to what happened at all, right? But hopefully that repetition is a nod to, to, to saying, Mammy Till, I feel you, I see you, I hear you, um, and, and I stand with you right within within this space of this poem yeah so i think that's a, an interesting point right talking about like you know like the idea of beyond the craft you mm -hmm. know i mean i talked to, to, to the idea of ancestry and how you're weaving that in to your work as well but i mean i think that like when you write you clearly always have an eye to like what the poem is doing beyond being a poem right like that it's not just this thing that's a an arrangement of words that has some line breaks in it but has like this potential um to, to do some work out in the world and um can you just speak a little bit to that I mean particularly in the sense of like you know social action and things right because I, I know that's what you what you focus on in your teaching too like yeah. how you consider like the work that the poem does as like an artifact for greater things in the world yeah yeah you know we we, we learned or heard probably many times like you write as solstice we write what you can't remain silent about I forget who said that like repeatedly somebody said it I don't know if it was Nicole somebody said it maybe Leron, somebody said, you write what you can't remain silent about, right? Cool, fresh, I get it, right? So you do see something, you witness something, you experience something, and it makes you write. But the problem is, after we write the thing, like for many folks, that's it. Instead of, okay, I'm going to write this thing, how can this thing go back into the world? That's the social aspect of it, right? Poetry is not a monolithic uh, experience, right? You're writing some things so that it can be communicated. Um, and so I think that as long as we do the, the, the truth telling that poetry is, I think that um, of course it'll be social, right? In nature, if we're doing the truth telling, if we're honest, if we're excavating like James Baldwin says, then mm -hmm. you know, poetry has no, no other way to, to function in the world, but through, through social action, right? Um, so it's not about like, oh, I'm gonna write this political poem. All poems are political. It's more so I'm gonna tell the truth Right, and in that honesty, that's where the the, the, the social action comes through. Um, yeah, that's. I hope that's 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 a good. <laughs> no, a good. I think that's important, man. And I think that the key thing about what's interesting about the idea of truth and what I love about your book and you know some of the stuff I hinted at in the foreword was you were very honest about yourself and your position, right, and yourself moving through the space, which is what's going to push me towards this next poem I want you to read. Right. Um, because I want you to read in defense of specific because I want to I want to talk about that that nature of um, how we implicate ourselves within that um, search for truth. So I'm gonna let you start with that and then I'll follow up. I gotta find it. Fresh. Okay. In defense of specific. Oh, cool. 62. Thank God for table of contents. In defense of specific, after Hanif Abdurki. Arithmetic, Y equals MX plus B, exam answer key, DNA, 212 degrees. The moment before water becomes overzealous, Christianity, Vila de la Rosa, 
650 yards, path to salvation, thou shall not kill. Sixth commandment, August 2nd, 1924, James Baldwin took his first breath, 128 pages in the fire next time. Six hours it took to read both days on a trip from Oakland, California to Portland, Oregon. 65 miles per hour speed limit on Highway 101. Semantics, inhale, exhale, the way the tongue curls air out the mouth, an abdomen contracting, hand gesture, thumb, index finger, connected as if to say, ways to pronounce, specific, one, eight letters, three syllables. Snow dissolves, steady on her brow raised as the demands, as she demands, Pacific. As thick as position, the stoop we sat on buried itself and 106th Street lay still, as did my posture, attempting to decode her tongue. The quarrel over the word specific left my mouth lusting for the body of water she referred to. She'd never been to California or traveled the 101 while the sun was setting in gridlock, my Timberland boots making beats on the concrete below them, each of us unmoved, blizzard, mid-April, I concede. Mm. Yeah, yeah. All right. Mm. And you got a poem. <laughs> so funny, yo. We didn't we didn't write our books together, y'all, but but they they converse in so many ways, which is wild, not just thematically, but um narrative wise, right? Uh craft wise. Um editor's note on code switching, page 50. Uh, hey man, he gave me the page call out. Look at that. I mean, cause, so because I'm I'm somewhat prepared, right? Yep. Um, so yeah, this is editor's note on code switching. Red pen ready. I lasso errant modifiers and force the lexicon of the uncommon folk. Child of the common tongue, I coerce commas to correction with comments. I erase all errors and copy mismatch antecedents. Scared of my keystrokes, I cut very really both and their comrades in the concision rebellion i rebuff in order to break meandered syntax into well-behaved airs of hemingway with active verbs is my vocation i strike passive voice banish participles on principle the faithful editor i bow before grammar a bounty of carrots my offering to this god in its name Manual of style spread on the desk. I cross off disobedient dashes. Insert semicolons to consecrate clauses. But when the workday concludes, I transpose my speech, spill every ain't and m, loosen my talk, unwind words. I learn from grown folks gossip. My grandmother gifted nigga please to my ears. Phrases created on the playground mispronunciations from my blue collar kin and friends. I am a child of the common tongue. The talk they teach you to tuck. I move between the master's tools and the speak my cousin spit. Saturday night, chicken grease slick. Sunday morning, hymnal crisp. Gosh, so first of all, again, <laughs> you know, the, music, the music in this joint is wild. And I think, um, like, you know, the black, black vernacular English that this poem kind of references, right? That's a nod to that, right? That's a nod to the musicality of, of black English, right? The idea that um, it has such a rhythm and a cadence to it. Um, I'm gonna return to that, but I have a question about this, this um, idea of kind of like talking about, like this, like a meta, a meta poem, right? About, about language. Um, but you don't choose to write the poem in like black vernacular English. Instead, you, you use kind of like this academic language to discuss black vernacular English until it's time to code switch and reference it. So I guess talk maybe a little bit about the process and how you decided to, um, what language you decided to use in this poem diction wise, right? Um, and how that uh, kind of affected, um, you know, the discussion of black vernacular English, um, yeah. Yeah, so in my like previous career, I did a lot of editing and it was just like crazy the days I would sit and like think about how much I was hammering people about grammar. And I'm just like, man, like, but I'm gonna get on Twitter like 
during lunch and talk about the colonization of language mm-hmm. <laughs> while I'm sitting here getting paid to do this. And so, um, yeah, I had to think about, you know, like, all right, so this is the tension I'm living with then, right? The tension is um, what I'm doing at my desk, at my computer, and what I'm doing on my phone when I'm talking about what I really feel about language outside of the corporate space. And so I had to think about, like, how am I going to translate that into the poem? Because, I mean, of course, like, the first thing that kind of went through my mind was, like, do I have the entire poem being one or the other and, you know, create the tension by the by the um, the content itself? But I think I wanted this idea of, you know, seeing that shift happen um, because of the fact that, you know, there's definitely like the ways in which we're trafficking in language, even like itself, right? We have our books and our books are doing these, this kind of switching. Um, and at the same time, right, there's like this perceived idea of universality, right? That, you know, yeah, we're, we're I'm writing for the people and there's like some stuff in here. It's like, man, if you know it, you know it. But at the same time, I'm trying to sell books, right? Like we all are trying to sell some books to some people. And so like we're trafficking in the same bit of tension at all times, like, you know, writing for the people and writing for the, um, yeah, you know, f- for the industry and the world we're in. So like, yeah, like the poem has to have this place where we have, where we see that transition. Right. Um, but at the same time, like it has to implicate the speaker, like the speaker can't, you know, get through the end of this poem and, oh, okay. Like, you know, they're just sitting here doing what they do. They're getting paid to do this and it's, it's cool. Right. Um, which is one of the reasons why when we talk about addiction, I really inflated that first part because I, I want this person to, to, they love it, right? And I mean, to be real, like as much as I have my, my beefs with grammar and stuff, like, yeah, I loved it. You know, I, I love figuring out stuff. Where I'm just like, man, like this, this in order to does not need to be here. You can just say two, right? Like yeah. I get hype off of that. I was like, that's problematic. You know, that's cool. It's fun, but it's problematic at the same time. Yeah, but like, all right. So I, yes, um, I have a follow-up question before I get to that. Mm-hmm. The, the response to what you just said is that also, uh, there's also a grammar to any, to any dialect, right? Or, or facet of, of English, like, you know, the different variations of English, right? Um, Black vernacular English has its own set of grammar, grammatical right. rules, right? Um, and the, the invariant B, you know, we can unpack that all day. It has a set of grammatical rules and the ways in which you use it, right? Um, so I think it's interesting that typically, like, when we talk about grammar, or yeah, when we talk about grammar or like these these rules that we talk about it in a way that like doesn't apply to other um, dialects or facets of English, but rather that it only applies to stand the myth of standard English, right? So I think it's a really interesting concept just in general, and that's pretty much what I all I do all day is is, is talk about. <laughs> talk about it. And that's that's my research. Um, so so we can get in that all day, but I do have um, a follow up question about something you said, which was that, um, oh, uh, what is it like to actually um, straddle that line between, um, so I've decided I don't wanna write a poem about the homies if the homies can't read the poem and understand it. So what does it mean to write a poem in a way that, or or write a poem in a language that's foreign to the homies if um, it's about them, right? Um, and so I, I've, I've kind of made this conscious decision that if I write a poem, it has to be accessible to the folks that it's about. Otherwise, what am I, who am I in community with? Who am I conversing with, right? And so I guess my question is, what has that been like for you? What is it like to, to write a poem um, about this cultural language, right? This cultural phenomenon that folks that are a part of that phenomenon might not be able to enter the way that they want to. Yeah, you know, it's that eternal struggle, right? Like, where do you, you know, like, where do you move the line, right? For like, who is this poem going to be for? Um, and, you know, there's, there's times when I think about the poems that are in this book, and, you know, there's a lot in the second half of it that are, you know, they reach us, right? They reach us and they speak to us, but they're not for us, right? Um, you know, I sit and I, I look at that poem that I have in there, the difference between nigger and nigga. And I just like think about how many people are gonna are, are gonna think that this is me saying that the word is terrible all overall, right? You know, in terms of like people of our culture using it, like and that this is some kind of indictment of that. But I'm just like, well, those people who are possibly reading it that way don't realize that this is a poem for you, right? This isn't a poem for my people, like this is a poem for you. So I need you to read into this. Yeah. But are there like ways in which that like my folks who are reading it like are gonna get it? Like when I reference, you know, the last dragon and show enough, like, yeah, like. Yeah, because I, I I want you to have a space in it, you know. Like one of the 
you know, greatest pieces of feedback I got was um, one of my cousins hit me up and just saying, it's brilliant, you know, right? And um, I know he's you know, been writing raps for, for, for a minute, for as long as I can remember. But, you know, hearing that was like yeah. one of the best reviews I can get because I know it's, it's reaching. But um, I mean, I think that it's it's that space where I, I'm just always asking myself for this poem, who needs to hear this? And if it's a certain kind of talk about certain cultural issues, like we know, right? Like you can put us through all the diversity workshops you want to, right? But like we have this lived experience and so I don't need to write a lot of those poems for, for us, you know, um, but I also don't feel like we are in any obligation to educate people about our suffering. But like, if I can't, if I can't help but speak about it, I'm not going to write it for us because we know, like we, we know, we know the story. Um, but what I will write for us is the poems about joy, right? Like if I'm writing this poem about space, like that's, that's, that's where I want us to sit. That's, I want us to be in that moment of peace and, and happiness. And I want other people to have access to that too, though, right? I want them to see it and be like, man, this is a really happy poem. That's yeah. cool. They get that. We get the fact that, man, like I remember that one time I was playing spades and the table got flipped because we've been there. So we get that extra la- layer to it too. So that's that's a little bit of the way I manage it. But um, I would ask the same of you as well, like, you know, because especially because of this poem, you were very much having this moment of where you were, you ready to fight over the correct pronunciation of a word, but then you back down. So like, how does that work for you and your poems? You know, cause of course, I mean, even like looking at your whole collection in terms of how you use capitalization, right? Like how do you straddle that line between like, you want to connect with, you know, with, with, with your people, but at the same time, you clearly have a level of, you know, how language, you know, is somewhat described as should be working. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's changed for me. And I guess, um, this change is like, you know, it's a sign of growth. Like anytime um, an idea change or your position on something change, it just demonstrates that you're you're interested in in the growth, right? Or understanding or unpacking something. So when it comes to that, it's changed for me. Like I used to actually, um, you know, I was an English major like in undergrad. So like I had teachers that were like, you know, I would have red marks all over my papers, right? Because, you know, grammar rules right, or, or whatever it was. And so, um, so a part of me, uh, you know, it's changed. You know, I went through this phase where like everything has to be like grammatically correct and, and the language I use needs to be academic, right? And I need to try to aspire or rise to this level of, um, I don't know, uh, uh, really staunch uh, uh, racist linguistic um, um, practice is, is pretty much mm-hmm. what it is. And, um, and then it changed, right? I understood that um, one, that's a terrible way of looking at language you know, as this monolithic thing. But I also realize we live in the West, this Western part of the world that's really, that really relies on um, the writer to do all the work. And so one thing that I really, really started thinking about is what does it mean to write poems in a language that's, that's native to me and that I'm comfortable with, and that I'm, I'm, I'm articulate in, um, and then have the reader do some work, right? Um, mm-hmm. If poetry is conversational, right? If, if poetry is not meant to exist solely in our notepads, then what does it mean to invite folks to actually sit with poem and wrestle with the poem and read the poem in a in a in an engaged way, as opposed to um, forcing the read, I mean the writer to do all of the work? And so now I I, I juggle that um, with just being comfortable with, with the language that I'm I'm used to um, and comfortable with, and that's how I write poems now. And I don't know if I'll, I'll do it any other way from now on. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a big piece, you know, this idea of like language of comfort. I mean, I'm like you too. Like I had this this idea that um, you know, like proper grammar was this amazing, you know, again, this idea of assumed of what grammar is, right? Proper grammar was this amazing ideal to strive toward. And I'm just like now, like unless people like correct like a typo on the internet, I'm just like, man, who's giving you a cookie for this every time? Like <laughs> Who's, who is really out here, like, you know, patting you in the back and saying, that's a good job. You're right. It is there, not there. And I yeah. just think about that kind of stuff, man. It's just like, we have, like, all this language, and it does so much. And, like, why mm-hmm. would you want to limit that? Like, why would you want to narrow that into, like, this one space when you could do so much more with it? Sure. And I think, you know, you're right about this idea of the conversation, how much work you want people to do, right? Um yeah. Matthew Zapruder and Why Poetry just like put it out and said like the only thing you need to do to read poems is, ha- is have a dictionary mm-hmm. right and like we have Google now too on top of that and so like I think about like you know like I have so much leeway with language I can do and um 
my work because of this conversation is happening. Like people are doing what I'm doing. Like if I don't know a word, if I don't know a reference, I'm like, word, okay, let me get on Google. Oh, that's cool. And then like what happens is I end up like researching a whole universe of context behind like one reference in the poem to better understand how it's working with the world. Word. And I think that's one of the great joys of what, you know, what the work can do, you know, where we can sit, we can engage in and out of the space of what's happening in the poem. Yep. Um, yeah. But I think yep. to that. Chris, go ahead, go ahead. You, know, I was listening to a podcast and Chris Obani was like, you know, English, and this is, this is something I've thought about too. English is such a utilitarian like language, right? We don't, we don't necessarily tell stories with, with our mere words. Other languages do, right? It's not like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I walk to the store, right? You're just utilizing the language to say, to, to communicate that you're walking to the store instead of utilizing the language to, to tell a story, right? Or paint a picture, right? Um, in, in, in Zulu, uh, uh, the, the native uh, language in South Africa, um, um, their last names weren't, weren't you know, names were like just they were stories, right? So I wouldn't just be Daniel Summerhill, I'd be Daniel, you know, story, right? Whatever my story mm -hmm. is, whoever my lineage, whoever my ancestry is. And so I think it's so fascinating to think about um, language outside of just utilitarian omnism, right? The idea that we can use language to tell a story and with, you know, with, with just the words that we use. Um, go ahead, I'll cut you off. No, I was say, I I want to get into, I would love to get into that a lot, but I, I did want to check that we have any, um, Lisa, if we had any questions that um, we might want to answer for some folks before we get get, get too deep <laughs> again. I, I I guess I know my, I had a kind of a question that was floating around in my head. If you want to take it, I'm also just like, so enjoying this conversation. Like I can also just let it go. But I think one thing that I was interested in is how you worked together, um, like, being each other's readers um, and like how like how that kind of worked out because I think that's something that when you um, get on a program you know how do you like forge forward with those relationships and because um, I think it's just so beautiful that there's so much of each other in your work and that you're still working together so if you want to address that I would love to hear some more but also feel free to keep jamming. Meg, Meg told us to fall in love with somebody's work when we when we got there, right? And, and Quentin was the person I chose to to fall in love with. And so, um, naturally, like I, you know, I, I read a lot of Quentin's work and, and try to uncover the way Quentin does stuff, right? And I guess that's just how it worked. Naturally, you know, the the, the themes and the um, things that he writes about are going to just drift into, into my work. But I think also it is a really interesting thing that Quentin and I are like vastly different in terms of like our, our aesthetic, the way that we approach it, um, our poems. We share many, many similarities. I think it's vastly different. So it's so interesting that we're able to connect the way that we do. Um, and I don't know, how do we start like workshopping and like exchanging poems, Quentin? Like how did it start? One of these right here. So. <laughs> It all started because as soon as we graduated from Solstice, we were sending each other text nearly every single day with the place to submit a manuscript to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if not that, it was like, okay, here's a journal, here's a contest. And it was for months and just back and forth, like, yo, I found this, I found this, I found this. This seems cool, but maybe blah, 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 but still, here's this, right? And that mm -hmm. kind of evolved into, you know, a lot of talk about, you know, not just where to submit, but what's happening with the work. So, of course, every time we got an acceptance, it's like, yo, check this out. Or it's like we get a rejection where it's like a really weird form of rejection. Like, yo, <laughs> yep. this is kind of weird. <laughs> or like, hey, um, this has been a big piece of conversation recently. Like uh, they said who won, but I, I still haven't got rejected yet. Like, what's good? You know, like these are the kind of conversations we're having where it's like, it's not just about like the poems, but like, you know, how we're existing as like literary citizens out in the world, right? So when the time comes for book number two for both of us, because we looked at each other's first books, but not as much as we did for the second. The second was kind of like the place where it was like, all right, so essentially like we read each other's like first or second books completely through. Like that was like, all right, here's the whole book read it tell me what you think okay. and I'm sitting here looking at divine 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 and I'm just like man it's really crazy to think that like at the point when I wrote my second book I had not read all of divine 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 yet like I hadn't seen the full thing because I'm just like 
I'm even just thinking like, man, like he has a poem in here that says um, Urban Dictionary says Daniel. And I'm uh-huh. just like, ain't that crazy? I just wrote a poem for the second book that he uh-huh. already looked at months ago. Yep. That's um, etymology featuring Urban Dictionary. And I'm just like, he's just like, yo, you realize I got a joint about this too, right? And I'm like, now I know. <laughs> like, and it's just like this, I mean, I, I hate that I keep using this word, but I come from corporate to some extent. So like the synergy, right? Like this idea that we come from these similar places. But like the thing is, as Daniel said, when you read these poems, you have no idea that the two people who who wrote them were talking to each other. Because like, it's that place where like that, that, um, that subjective poet kind of comes in and takes that experience to different places, which, you know, when we talk about this idea about writing to you know, the era of our childhood and our, and our nostalgia. Um, it's great to read these poems together because you get a whole universe of like what it's like for various people to talk about the same subject matter and from two different places, right? Like it's 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 a shared language, but it's also like that, that, li- that little bit of divide too, which is like this amazing thing about how blackness is amazing and so multifaceted and itself is not monolithic. And um. I think us embracing that was what really drove us to kind of share the work too, because we get to see some stuff we're familiar with be defamiliarized for us. I think it's it's also demonstrative, like the way that our the synergy how it how it happens. I think it's demonstrative of the way that language, um, you know, uh, how language kind of connects like black folks, right? It's the idea that we have this, I, you you know, Chicago, Oakland, right? But but we, we share a similar language. And in that way, then our poems can converse with one another because of that shared language, that shared cultural um, language, right? So I think in many ways, that's the way that it manifests itself, right? Through through the language that we use. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that big piece with the revision, you know, that that idea of shared language, that's where it comes through where like, I mean, I tell you straight up, like on that second manuscript, um, Daniel just had comments that just said, nope, <laughs> like you can do better than this, right? And I didn't have to sit and like, write back like, yo, like this is really unclear. I don't understand what you mean, right? Because like we had that shared language. I understood exactly what he meant by that. Like, you know, like, okay, like this is what, like this poem that's about this shared experience that we may have that we're talking about differently. This is this is what you're what you're missing. This is what 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 more needs to happen, and it's that trust we built up too, right? Like that's not something that's not a comment you can get from some people you just met in workshop. Like that's something we built up over, you know, um, a couple of years in the program, and then like at that point, um, a year and a half after, yeah. where it was just like, yeah, like okay, like I got to do this work because like at the same time he's like we share this experience and there's more that you're going to do, but like you have to reach at that because I can't reach at it because there is that bit of like, okay, you Chicago suburbs in there that you got to pull that, that I can't pull that from open. So yeah. I think that's one of the things you got to really look for when you, you know, when you're getting some people in your, your writing groups and all that is some people who yeah. you, know, you can build that kind of trust with. It's not always going to be cultural, but it's going to be this idea that um, you share some understandings about what kind of stories, you know, this other person is trying to tell and um, giving them that space to reach for it on their own while pushing them at it a little bit as well. And I think that was you know, the most helpful thing. I mean, the second book wouldn't be here without it. And of course, a lot of these poems in the first book came up in our workshops together, you know? And mm-hmm. I mean, I think a lot of that, um, that feedback that was there between the two of us as well as everybody else in the group, right? Like, you know, you got to build that trust to say like, all right, now you got to go forth and actually make this work because we can't rewrite the poem for you. Yeah, 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 100%, 100%. Um, how, how are we doing on, on time, uh, Becca, Lisa? Yeah, I was going to say, if you wanted to um, close out with a poem each, that would be lovely. I'm going to share links to your book in the chat right now for anyone who might not have these books yet. So um, I'm a, how about we pick for, we want to pick for each other on the close out? Yeah, let's, let's pick for each other. Okay. For each other. Man, that's tough then. All right. Um you got one? You know, you know what you want oh, to I, do? oh, I've already got one. And oh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna have you read um Urban Dictionary says Daniel for us okay. because you know okay I just talked about it. I hyped it up for everybody. <sighs> okay. I'm gonna have you read. So many joints. Um, okay. 
Granny's Absolutes. Is that okay? Oh, all right. Yeah, that's cool. That's dope. Sure. I haven't. I've, I've literally. I don't think I've ever read that. Nah, one nah, nah, nah. I'm changing it. I want you to read. Wow. The, it says America Burns. Read that one. Oh. Okay. Oh, all right. Yeah. So you, just, you flip. You flip the page. It was like, all right. Yep. That's all right. So I'm gonna read. Uh, Urban Dictionary says Daniel. All right. Cool. And you close it out. Urban Dictionary says Daniel is a black boy or black boy, or is a black and black boy, and still is a poem with complexity and extended metaphor that does not include prisoner or junkie or anything not self-proclaimed. The way stigma always seems to autofill itself is blade, is rebellion by breathing, is nigga pronounced nig a uh, depending on the day, is a Gibson Le Paul between Muddy Water's fingers, sweaty yet triumphant, is a Chicago blues hall in the 40s, is enough grace to cat call tomorrow like it was some sort of courtship. Man, that poem kills me with the meter. You, just, like, you line me up and then you like knock me down. I forgot there's more to the poem, I didn't finish it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to put the, put the page. It's my poem and I forgot there's more. <laughs> I'm going to finish it out. To cat call tomorrow, like it was some sort of courtship, is a swollen belly, is hunger, is the smell of hunger, a plastic spatula left on the stage, I'm sorry, on the stove, or baking soda, and hot water, is hot water just before it boils. Mama gave me a biblical name, one that means God is my judge, or in other words, there ain't a person walking earth with enough holy in their body to try and break its cadence. One that means you will bury me one day, but before my song comes to a close, I will call you by your name and nothing else. I will call you by your name. It has always, always been enough. All right, the data says America burns. All right, all right. I, I thank you, I thank you earned that, especially, um. How dope is that? That like he get in anywhere in that poem. That's why I love your work, man. All right, the data says America burns. The data slithered through the umbilical cord. It breached the placenta, foretold floods of misfortune in the amniotic fluid. Kicking and screaming, the data met light. My mother swaddled the decimal point latched to her breast. Infant body cupped like a comma curved between digits. When I was a toddler, the data dismantled an electrical outlet. It was curious about how the world worked. Older data knew already, so it burned Los Angeles for five days while I said my first sentences. The data started to count and stopped when I was six. My grandfather smoked cigarettes until statistics smothered his lungs with tumors. This time, Florida went up in flames. One summer night, everything black but security lights, the data struck a match, lit a cigar, and handed it to my father. My mother said it was a gift from his friends at my birth. The data spiraled from the lit tip like smoke. My father, a shadow in the dark. In school, teachers warned about the data. Some students already had mouths full of percent signs. Their tongues clicked like tickers. When I met those kids on the wrong block, on the wrong day, the data kept a knee on my spine. Cincinnati smoldered. And then America crackled in the jet fuel bonfire. Wasn't it always embers? Wasn't it always Oakland? The data thought so and slipped a few figures in my palms when I turned 21. Florida incinerated again. The flames found new kindling, crawled from Ferguson to Cleveland, to New York, to Charleston, to Baltimore, to Waller County, to Falcon Heights. One in every, two in every, three in every, four in every, the data spilled tens and hundreds and thousands and millions into streets. At 27, I talked with my wife about counting down from nine and statistics said, remember, I wrote shotgun when cops stopped you in Chicago, in California, a new blaze sparked in Sacramento. And I tried to tally the tip of each flame. I think you just love that poem because I said Oakland in it. Yeah. Actually, that was my friend even noticing this Oakland poem. So that's 
That's not true. It's just a dope <laughs> poem. It's just a dope poem. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think basically I'd love if people um, want to unmute and say, like, clap and say hello, because this has just been such a lovely, lovely event. Um, we're probably going to... Um, throw your books again in the chat. If you have any social media that you wanna share, like links for anyone to follow you. Um, I think that like, I don't know. It, I'm just so happy that Lisa and I were able to have you here tonight and to create this space for y'all. And um, I don't know, I'm still like vibrating from all the conversation and I have so many questions and I wanna keep talking, but I know that we also have to let people continue on with their evenings. <laughs> Um, so yeah, Lisa, do you have anything you want to add? Um, same thing you did. I, I don't even know if I can make words right now. That was so much, that was everything I, I hoped it would be and more. Thank you for being here and for sharing this space. And I hope everybody gets your books and, and the next books. Yeah. I just want to say, I'm so proud and moved and flabbergasted and happy and that you talked so much about sound and language, you know, you, you're you offering us a new language. And I can't tell you how happy I am to learn it. I love you both. We love you too. Yeah. Ron. Can we clap out loud now? Oh, please, please. Okay. Yay. I'll clap for Dang too. It was wonderful. I love the back and forth. That was so great. Thank yeah. you so much. Yes. Uh, yeah, Lisa, Becca, Patrick, everything. This was great. It was so good to, to get to rap with Quinny right, organically and yeah. convert. So again, thank you so much.